Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. The final slot of the afternoon. Isn't it wonderful for those of us who are actually here to be physically at the Polyglot Gathering after two years when we couldn't meet up? I want to challenge you today with a question, and that question is, have you got, have we got, the fluency mindset? I'm Dr. Gareth Popkins. I'm a language enthusiast, a language learner, tutor and coach, and I blog about language learning at howtogetfluent.com, where I also have a German course. And today, then, I want to start with a mindset audit. As we go through, if any questions come to mind, then you can use Slido for those. And don't wait till the end. You can type your questions into Slido as we go. We'll make it easier for you to remember. So we're going to look at six mindset shifts from less to more helpful ways um, of thinking about our personal language learning. And as we go, I'm going to interweave some practical ideas and action points that we can take. Because it's all very well thinking about these things, we've also got to do something about it as well. But what even is mindset when it comes to language learning, and why does it matter? Well, mindset is part of the whole range of individual learner differences among as language learners among people. And there are many spheres in which we differ as learners. Obviously, our life circumstances, our families, our age, our economic position, our geography, where we are as we learn our languages. But also, of course, our cognitive abilities, our mental endowments, our genes, if you like, linked with them very much, perhaps our personality traits. And then there's the whole area of what are called the affective variables. Affective here means related to thoughts and feelings. And this, I think, is where we start to get slightly warmer, slightly closer to the idea of mindset. So mindset, yes, is the realm of thoughts and feelings. And we can break that down further. On the one hand, we've got questions of motivation. People look into this. They talk, on the one hand, of what I've called drive. What's pushing us or pulling us to learn a language? Is it something intrinsic we want to do from the inside, our desire? Or is it something extrinsic that's been imposed on us? Our boss has told us we need to learn a language. Our teachers at school to pass an exam. Usually it's thought that intrinsic motivation is more powerful, but extrinsic can be useful sometimes too. It's carrot and stick. And then in terms of purpose, instrumental, do we have immediate practical reasons to learn the language? Yes, I want to do it, but I need to do it for my job. Or is it more integrative, personal growth, cultural enrichment? And then besides mind, uh, motivation in mindset, we've got the attitude side, the attitude side of uh, what I would call our stance. So what's our attitudes towards the target speaker group? And success at learning a language has been found to vary according to whether learners uh, aspire to join the group or not. The relative social status of the group can often explain why in society at large some languages spread, some seem to be picked up by speakers in a community, a multilingual community, or not. And then our attitudes towards success in general as learners. Are we the sort of person who's not a quitter, who likes to make a success of what we're doing? Because if we are again, that's a mindset which might set us in good stead to have success learning languages. And what are our learning preferences as individuals? What are our beliefs about language learning? And it's in these areas, I think, that we're talking about the language mindset. But it also ranges back then across the other areas of difference as well. Our attitudes, our feelings about our circumstances, our abilities, our personality, for example, and we look at those things. 
Now, one might think, well, we're all right. We're language enthusiasts. That's why we're here at a gathering of other language learning lovers, so to speak, or those who are language curious. We might think then, we're already sorted. We've, we, we've got the right mindset already. After all, we've probably got very healthy attitudes to different cultures, to the culture of the language we want to learn, for example, and to the language learning process, something we believe in, something we want to find more out, more about. And we've probably got high levels of intrinsic motivation then. We're here because we want to be here, not because someone has told us we've got to open those language books or click on that app. And if we've learned more than one language, we're probably building up quite a bit of reflective language learning experience too. So we might think, no problem, I'm sorted. I don't need to work on my, my mindset. However, I think we've all got room for improvement. I certainly do, as a language learner myself, have to keep thinking about all these things, constantly reassessing my mindset and, of course, then my practice off the back of that. And as language enthusiasts, of course, we also have a number of mindset traps that we could easily get into. We probably set the bar as language learners, certainly in present company, among other language learners, pretty high. We've got then these ambitious goals. I'm determined to get fluent. I'm going to do it. I'm straining to do it. I really want to be a, polytot, a polyglot. Six languages, seven, eight, nine, ten. And of course, I'm interested in materials and methods, and I'm always chasing the optimal way of doing things. There's always going to be a better course out there, a new method, a new technique I haven't tried yet that I'm hearing about. And of course, the temptation to take on multiple languages. So the bar is high. And of course, also another trap we're always comparing ourselves with other language learners and often perhaps falling rather short. X has more free time. Y has a better memory. I'll never be as good as Z at learning languages. So there are mindset traps for us as language enthusiasts too. So, it's time for the mindset audit. Relax on that couch, start to reflect. Maybe some changes in perspective will come from this reflection and some changes in action too. So six mindset shifts. Let's dive in. Number one, from the mindset of feeling trapped by our life circumstances to taking control. Now, there are two parts to this. But first of all, what are the dangers of this mindset? Well, you might think, if only my circumstances were better, if only I lived in the country, if only I lived in Spain, my Spanish would come on at great speed. If only I were younger, I'd have a better memory then. I'd understand all this tech better. I'd have more time. I can't afford a teacher, or I don't have money for language learning materials. They cost too much. So all this negative thinking can arise from our circumstances. I don't have the time. Well, we've got to take control. On the one hand, change what we can. And this could be quite big things in your life. There are people among us who've moved countries, moved towns, because we want to live in a multilingual, a bilingual environment, in a, a country where another language is spoken. That was certainly a motivation for me and has been at various stages in my life. People who've made career decisions, obviously easier when you're in education, coming out of education, but later on as well, people make career changes. I've spoken to one or two of you here this week who have done that or who could do that, who then are able to uh, have...
opportunity to use a language in work. Our social circle. I'm not saying ditch your friends, but maybe expand your social circle a bit to find opportunities to learn a language. People who are going to support you and motivate you and inspire you to do that. Our use of free time. What are you prepared to give up to spend time with and in your language? What are you going to give up? Because everything has a price. Now, of course, it's easy enough for me to say, you should move, you should change jobs. But, of course, sometimes we can't make the big changes. But what we can all do is uh, reframe the situation and our circumstances. So we can change, we can work on things we can't change, within limits at least. Older learners, instead of regretting uh, you know, advancing years, we can look at the positive side. You may have more confidence, uh, more funds, certainly if you're retired, perhaps more time as an older language learner. Geography, well, you might not be able to drop everything and move to a different country, but of course you can get a long way looking for local speaker communities of your language. Easier in a big city, but you might be surprised if you start to look in your area. You could host travelers who speak your languages. There are websites and clubs you can join online to enable you to do that. You can use the web, of course, to make contact very easily, far easier than ever before, with communities of speakers. Your economic situation, well, there are so many wonderful free materials out there now that really uh, I can't afford the materials is not the mindset to have. And you can do language exchanges and tandems and go to meetups, uh, again, without any money changing hands. Job, well, you might not want to be able, want or be able to change your job, but are there opportunities to use your language at work? Or at least in the gaps at the lunch hour, can you find a quiet corner and listen to a podcast as you eat your sandwiches? Can you get on the Anki app or use your flashcards on your commute? There are opportunities within the constraints of our circumstances to shift our mindset to say, let's take control, let's make the most of it, and then to act on that. So that, I think, is an important shift. And even in our family, can we reconnect with relatives who know the language if we're a heritage learner? Can we learn with our kids? In Wales, a lot of parents send their children to Welsh immersion schools, and they see this as an opportunity, grandparents sometimes too, to learn the language along with the children. It's a great motivation, a great reason to learn. At the very worst, if you've got a lot of family commitments, can you get up a bit earlier and get 30 minutes in uh, working on your language, listening to your language, a quick lesson online before the chaos starts in the house? So yeah, let's take control, let's make the most of the circumstances we have, rather than being stuck wishing things were different. And it's a bit similar, I think, with the second reset. From regretting our personality and our lack of talent, let's move instead to playing to our strengths. Now, the dangers of this mindset, regretting who we are, can I have a personality transplant, please? No. But the dangers of that thinking, if only I were more extroverted, that's me thinking that, yeah? Others might think, if only I were more introverted, less shy. If only I had the language gene. I'm not clever enough for this game. I'll never be as good as Zed at learning languages. Let's move, let's shift. Let's instead play to our strengths. Let's remember that in terms of cognitive abilities with language, talent, as it were, aptitude is multifaceted. It's not just one thing. It's our ability to hear sounds and process them. How good is our working memory? How good are we at recognizing patterns? And these things vary. And it's unlikely that you're equally useless across the whole range. You will have strengths within your cognitive ability. And of course, some of them get better with practice. And the odds are that all of us are good enough. We may not end up as star interpreters, star polyglots, but we can all do a lot better than we might think in several languages and certainly learning our first foreign language. 
and we can maximize our given brain power, however good our genes are, and of course, some people have enviable talents, but what we've got, we can maximize. We can learn about learning, learn about interactive methods like space recall, the testing effect, elaboration, emotionally connecting, uh, interactively studying and engaging with our languages. We can read about these things, we can build our meta skills, as they're called, develop our learner experience, whatever our genes are. It's the same with personality. We can exploit our introvert advantage or our extrovert one. Obvious, if you're an extrovert, you can go into a bar, start striking up conversations, get into conversations when you only know 50 words with somebody at the, on the bus, yeah. Great. You may find it harder to focus down, to knuckle down. The introvert will be great at doing that. Great at reading, maybe more of a studious type, good at reinforcing the practice that you're getting. So work with your personality. Move to the mindset of saying, I'm going to play to my strengths rather than regretting those weaknesses that we all have. The third mindset. From the search for optimal methods and materials to engaging with adequate ones. Here I think for those of us who are language enthusiasts is a particular temptation to fall into various traps. Look, another shiny object, the so-called shiny object syndrome. New books, new courses, new methods. Have you tried shadowing? Yeah. Have you heard about backchaining? Have you done this, tried this app, tried that app? What about this new online course? There's a new book out from a certain author. Uh, I've already got two of his German courses, but I'll just get another one. This, this one's going to be the one that finally makes me fluent. Of course, the result would be a danger that we just lack focus and lack consistency. So let's not search constantly for the optimal. There is no holy grail of method. There's no one magic method. In fact, the truth is there are lots of different approaches for early encounters with a language. You can front load your output, speak from day one type approach. You can front load your input, a lot of listening, reading at the beginning. You can take more of a deliberate learning approach at the beginning, building up a core vocabulary, studying some grammar patterns before you launch into your listening, your speaking, and so on. And there are examples uh, among language learners of people whose uh, practice at the beginning is weighted in all three of those directions. Usually it's a mixture, but are weighted in all those directions, and they're people who get fluent by starting off that way, so that you doesn't have to be, you know, there's not just one magic holy grail. What we need to do is experiment with routines and methods and materials, of course, to find things that fit for us, that work for our personalities, our circumstances, our preferences. But then, when we found them, we need to stick with routine, with a small number of effective practices and materials, Give it chance. Maybe it's going to be for three, six months. Give something an opportunity to work for a year. Leave those shiny objects if you can. Easier said than done. Or put them on your list, take a photograph of that book or that app, and don't actually download it or buy it. Stick, stay focused with uh, the blend you found that works for you. Now, our personal blend may not be perfect, but if it keeps us, if it keeps you and me as individuals engaged and interacting with a language, speaking, listening, reading, writing, we will make progress. So don't let the perfect, the optimal, be the enemy of the adequate of the good in your language learning. Make that shift and work with, stick with, be consistent with uh, an approach and some materials that work for you, that keep you engaged, and interact with them. Then, you can reassess, of course, at intervals. Give it time. As you progress through the stages of language learning, of course you want to move to try other things, to move on to other things, as you identify weaknesses. You've done a lot of listening, then you're ready to start speaking. That sort of thing. And what we change will 
uh, what we need will change as our level improves and as our life circumstances perhaps change. You'll need to reassess to mix the blend again. But then, again, get down to it, stay focused. The fourth mindset shift from striving for a breakthrough to taking our next steps. And I often find that uh, my coaching clients come to me and they are looking for this magic breakthrough. When will I be fluent? It's just not happening for me. It's an all or nothing type thinking. This is the trap, perhaps. We set ourselves unrealistic goals and then we beat ourselves up. Discouragement and impatience set in when we're not making that breakthrough. We're just not feeling it. It's just not happening for us. We haven't got fluent. Disappointment, perhaps, and disillusionment sets in. This is a mindset to guard against, striving for a breakthrough. So let's take it step by step. So break up the task. Now, what could these steps, though, be? Well, it might be that you're moving up the uh, uh, attainment scale. The Common European Framework of Reference for Languages has this scale of uh, abilities across speaking, reading, listening, and writing from A1 up to C2 at the top. And it may be that you're working up with reference to some sort of objective ability scale like that, climbing the ladder, climbing the mountain, to use that metaphor. You can break up the task that way. But you might also want to think in terms of what uh, one great teacher in the world of language learning, Barry Schechtman, called Islands of Fluency, where you develop your ability to speak about particular topics that are of relevance to you, about your family, about your interests, your hobbies, uh, vocabulary and conversations for your career. And then gradually, you build these islands. Rather like off Dubai, where they're building these you know, reclaimed islands, and then you have an archipelago. And then you have a continent as you join up these islands and fill them in. You could progress that way. Well, you could think in terms of the steps being doing new things in the real world with your language, having experiences in the language. So let's make the most as well of what we can do at each stage on the scale or on each island or with each experience. And we can do that by making the task uh, level appropriate for us. So if we're setting uh, a next step to do some reading, you can find something which is aimed at your level. Easier with the more spoken languages because there are more materials out there. But you can be resourceful as well and make and work with a teacher to help you make, or a language partner to help you simplify, use technology uh, to help you make, uh, to make uh, materials more accessible to you if you're reading or you're using subtitles and captions, if you're watching or finding sympathetic conversation partners. So there are things we can do to make the most even if we're at the lower stages of our language learning. Some examples. And a good way to do it is to use the old SMART analysis. Make them specific, measurable, action-oriented, relevant, time-bound. SMART is the acronym. For example, you might want to practice scripts, so conversations you might have for 10 common professional situations before a business trip to the country. So it's specific, it's time-bound. You might think, well, I'm going to read three simplified novels suitable for my level in the next six months. You might think, well, I'm going to have five conversations with native speakers when I'm on holiday this October in the country. Maybe you'll think I'm going to learn 10 songs or poems by heart by the end of the summer. Or maybe I want to take a language exam before Christmas. People knock exams. Of course, they're not the be-all or end-all, but it is something very specific, and I've used them as a tool and I've certainly engaged a lot more with my language than I might have done because I've got the, uh, the deadline of an exam coming up in a few months' time. Now here, you know, some of my own examples of enjoying your wins, large and small in a language. So if we're thinking in terms of the third uh, idea, the third type of step that I had, new life experiences, you know, do take time to pat yourself 
on the back, as it were. So, for example, I remember uh, the first time I took a cab in Japanese, well, actually managing to negotiate with the driver to take me uh, to the station in uh, Hiroshima. Uh, and this is me in the, the very cab. Uh, but also I remember an, an evening I had when I was learning Welsh, which was one of the first languages I got fluent in uh, for family reasons. My family background is from Wales. Well, I had an evening with distant relatives of my dad's cousins in Welsh, all in Welsh. This was for me a huge thing, a huge experience which I wanted to celebrate. A conversation I had on live radio in Basque, pretty hair-raising. I didn't feel ready to do it, but we got through it, and it felt great afterwards, at least, although not beforehand. Job interviews that I've done in Russian and in German. Sometimes I got the jobs, sometimes I didn't, but nevertheless, this for me, were, these, were, these were steps, and in a way, they are sort of breakthroughs, even though you're not moving from not fluent to fluent. So yeah, break it up. Take it in stages and celebrate as you go. Now, from worrying about mistakes to embracing imperfection, another shift that you might need to make or one might need to go back to reassessing. The dangers here are obvious, I think. Fear of embarrassment for many people about getting it wrong, appearing stupid, being like a child again, not letting your natural uh, intelligence, your natural wit come through because you're doing everything several levels dumber than you would be in your native language. People will judge me, you might feel. Or you might, be, uh, you might have a slight tendency towards perfectionism. Maybe it's a form of vanity that it hurts your self-image if you're uh, actually making mistakes in the language. Now, here's a, a great piece of news, actually. Nobody really cares very much about your language abilities, about my language abilities. If you think about it, when you're using a language with other people, it's either transactional. You're trying to buy a rail ticket. You're in a queue of busy people. The person behind the counter just wants to serve you quickly. You're buying a loaf of bread. You're ordering a beer. Or it's, it's a, a meaningful conversation when people are more interested in your message, actually than the way you're putting it across. And there's nothing more irritating, really, is there, when you're, you're speaking with someone who's learning your native language, and they are constantly then uh, correcting themselves as they go. It's spoiling the message. Nobody cares about our skills, and that's great. Mistakes are actually a sign that we're using the language, yeah? So do embrace them. And getting stuck can help us notice what we need to work on. One thing I often say I, uh, in my work as, as a lawyer is uh, to juniors, you know, you can't get good, you can't get good, you can't get better and look good at the same time. Yeah? An expert, somebody who's skilled in something, is somebody who's made all the mistakes in the book. So the sooner you get on, get out there making those mistakes in a reflective way, the better it's going to be. That, I think, is the mindset to have. And getting stuck can help us to notice, oh, I can't say that, I don't know that word. How do I actually express that? What tense should I be using there? Now, of course, there are dangers here with just letting it all hang out, yeah? One is that we have then fossilized mistakes. If you've got a mindset of continual improvement, then yeah, of course, you might want to get corrective feedback. Often better from someone experienced at doing this, like a teacher, rather than a general native speaker who might not be able to then explain to you how, why it's not right or how you can improve. But get some feedback, and sometimes we can revise fundamentals. Yeah, they do this in tennis coaching, I think, you know, the big tennis stars. Their coaches take the game apart. Start again with some fundamentals. Go back to an, a, a, an early textbook that you used when you were starting, an early course. When you know 99% of it, you suddenly notice one or two things you'd forgotten, even though they were in the first or the second chapter. So that can be useful now and again. But basically, just get on with it. Embrace that imperfection. And the final shift is from learner identity to living the language. 
Now, the danger here is that we just see ourselves as learners. This is maybe the biggest shift of all that we need to make. We hang out with other learners. We just engage with learner materials. Of course, it's great to hang out with other learners, not knocking it, but not just that. We don't want to focus on what's different about us and native speakers instead of what makes us similar. Maybe we're even just too results-oriented in our whole approach to language learning. So we've got to move from a learner identity to actually living the language. Put on the hat that goes with the language. Maybe think of it not as steps or islands or series of experiences that you're going to tick off, as it were, but actually as a sort of infinite game. We're not striving to win at this game, but we're interacting in the language for its own sake. We want to participate in the community of speakers, fluent or less fluent. There's no better way to do that than to share our interests, our enthusiasms and hobbies in our target language. So get involved in groups. Online it might be first if you're not in the country. But there are ways that you can do this and engage in stages more passively at first, perhaps, and then contributing more as you become more confident and as your skills build up. Shared enthusiasts, shared professional interests, shared passions, they're the best way to uh, build real lasting relationships in the language that aren't about the language, but they're about something else that really helps to connect you with other people. Sample as much of the culture as you can, even if you don't intend to pursue it all. I'm not into sports much, but I do need to know some of the vocabulary, some of the main events in uh, the sporting year in the countries whose languages I'm learning, for example. Some of the basic vocabulary. Incorporate traditions and habits from our new culture into the rhythms of our life so that we're really living the culture and the language wherever we are. I do that with the Welsh annual Eisteddfod or the annual day of the Basque speakers, for example. I'm aware of these things. They're part of the rhythm of my life. So there we are. To wrap up our audit, are you feeling trapped by circumstances? Well, take control. Change what you can. Do we regret our personality or our lack of talent? Well, we are what we are. Yeah, there are things we can do to improve, but we can also play to our strengths. Searching always for optimal methods and materials. Instead, let's really engage with what we've got, with ones that are adequate. Striving for breakthrough. Instead, let's have the mindset of taking the next steps. Worrying about mistakes. Well, let's embrace imperfection, but also get appropriate feedback every now and again. Stuck in a learner identity. Well, instead, let's start living the language. And if we all reflect, we make some changes, and we move towards thinking more in these sorts of ways, and then taking action on them, I think we'll all be able to say, yes, we've got the fluency mindset. Thanks a lot. Okay, we've got uh, one or two questions. Hey, Gareth, what are some mind traps, mindset traps that you've had, and how did you overcome them, if I did? Good question. Well, I, I, as I said, I think I um, do admire people who are naturally more extroverted than I am as uh, language learners. And for me, often, it's the mentality of getting out of my shell and not worrying too much about my performance, a bit of a tendency towards perfectionism. Those are the sort of things that I struggle with. But I've also got great strengths, I think, which help me. I'm quite good at sticking at things once I've started. I'm quite stubborn, so that's a positive. So again, I'm trying to focus on that rather than my weaknesses, of which I'm all too aware. The next question sort of links up to that, doesn't it? Uh, the introvert advantage. Introverts generally are people who are very good spending time on their own. And they often um, have, uh, you know, they more stimulation from inside rather than necessarily with connecting with other people. It doesn't mean you don't want to connect with other people, but in small doses. 
And that can be great if you like reading, you like studying, working with flashcards, and you might like deeper one-to-one -one personal conversations rather than being in a large group. So I think we have to cut, cut our cloth, don't we? And find the sort of actual interactions with people that work for us as introverts or extroverts. Some of us are never going to be the life and soul of the party, but it doesn't mean we can't have very meaningful connections one-to-one -one or in smaller groups. Uh, did, did anybody ever laugh at your language mistakes? I have such an experience and it helped me so much more to remember the vocabulary or grammar. Shame your way fluent. That's an interesting one. Um, people have laughed at my language mistakes very often, uh, I suppose, but um, uh, you know, it has to be water off a duck's back. I don't know about laugh, but I do remember uh, once at the gathering, um, a, a friend of mine, he's not here this year, but he did an interview with me in Russian on YouTube. Uh, we were speaking different languages, and uh, somebody wrote underneath uh, the YouTube, um, your accent's great, but that other guy's accent is useless, you know? And then he came back, actually, a few comments later to add some more insults to my Russian, about my Russian accent. So you've got to think, well, OK, you know, it's a bit sad, really. Do what you can, play to your strengths. And yeah, as you said, um, Anonymous, uh, you drew strength from that. Yeah, take everything as a learning experience. Um, what languages are you currently working on, if any? Uh, I'm working mainly on my uh, intermediate Basque and my beginners, very beginners, Japanese. They're the two I'm actually focused on. And, uh, but there's a whole list of others which are waiting in the queue. Can I share my daily routine for language learning? I go for the, uh, what I call the focus study slot. So that's normally 30 minutes at a time. I tend to have a timer, a Pomodoro technique going. And I will always try and get that in. And uh, I tend to find it's useful to do it first thing in the morning. Sometimes I go for a jog in my local park, and then uh, I will do my 30 minutes or the other way around. Because I find that later on, things then happen, and I can't get the same focus necessarily. But then I will listen also more passively to the languages uh, on the podcast when I'm running, when I'm washing the dishes, have the radio on, things like that. And I'll often then when I'm relaxing in the evening, most of the uh, uh, films I watch and radio shows are actually in my different languages rather than in uh, my native English. And I suppose that answers the next question as well, how do I maintain my languages? I do find that uh, with the more advanced languages, it becomes a lot easier if you're still passively using them, uh, if you're listening a lot, reading a lot, which I do in my advanced languages. And then when I go to the country or meet a speaker, I'm a bit nervous for the first few interactions, but then suddenly you get back into the flow once you get to a high enough level, I think. Um, uh, what do you think of the Geschwind uh, Galaburda hypothesis? I've never heard of it, so I won't make any comments on that. <laughs> How do you decide, sorry, how do you decide which language to learn? Do you pick them up because of culture or some sound or some other reason? A mixture, I think. Let's face it, many of us don't need much of a reason to start learning a language, and that's part of our problem often <laughs> if we're enthusiasts. With Welsh, it was a heritage thing. French I had at school. Welsh was a heritage thing, but I'd also seen the language written on the signs in Wales, and it seemed so un unpronounceable that it seemed a real challenge. It was partly identity, it was partly heritage. Uh, Russian, it was because I was interested in Russian history, and I could see this was obviously a country with a large uh, and great literature I wanted to learn. German, similarly. With Basque, uh, it was the exoticness of it. Also because I was interested in the linguistic, the politics of linguistic revival from my experiences in Wales, and because it was different, you know, a, a different system uh, to, uh, to, uh, to challenge me to get interested in. Any tips uh, to those with, uh, to learn those languages with tones? No, I, I've never learned a language with tones. I'm struggling with pitch in Japanese at the moment. But there are YouTube uh, videos on tones, and often in English there are, uh, these tones are often present in different ways. We use intonation, but not at the level of individual words. But it's something I think that it, that it pays to work on uh, without stressing about it, as I understand it. But I, I haven't learned a tonal language. 
Thank you very much for those kind words, and I think we can wind up there. Thanks very much, and again, thank you for being here today.